Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, really glad to be back at ODSC. Um, and the, the title of my talk today um, is Understanding Unstructured Data with Language Models. So I wanted to start off by just telling you, I'll just get my clicker working here. Um, I wanted to start off by telling you why I wanted to do this talk today, why I talk about unstructured data and language models. And the real reason is that I think both of these things have been kind of a bit overlooked by our community. So you know, we have unstructured data, which is kind of this, this ugly duckling. Uh, and by the way, if unstructured data doesn't necessarily mean that much to you right now, we'll, we'll rigorously define it later on. But unstructured data, I think, is often seen as just this like, pile of stuff that's not necessarily like, that valuable, which I think is a real shame and a real missed opportunity. And then we have um, language models, which we're going to talk a, a lot about today. Um, and I think they're also this sort of ugly duckling. Um, a, a bit of a side note here. Um, it turns out it's really difficult to think of a good picture for language models. Um, so this kind of abstract space agey blue computer thing is kind of what I'm using throughout. Um, so language models, again, I think they're a bit of an ugly duckling, um, just because um, they're not necessarily thought of negatively, but I think they're often overlooked. They haven't really made it into our sort of canonical data science toolbox, really. Um, and I think both of these things are a real shame, because both of these things are extremely powerful, and especially together, um, they can give us some incredible insight. So I'm hoping in this talk I can kind of reveal the beautiful swan-like nature of both of these things. OK. So I'm going to stop torturing that metaphor now. Um, and I want to talk about, um, I just want to lay out what I want to cover um, in this talk today. So I want to start off by talking a bit about the origins of language models, because I think it's actually a really fascinating story. Um, then I want to talk a bit about what we even mean by unstructured data, and then illustrate how unstructured data can be used with language models with some interesting case studies. Then we'll get into some of the nuts and bolts of what exactly um, we mean by language models, what they are, and the different types out there, and, and really try and bring this all the way up to the present day, because there's been some really big and exciting advances in language models in just the past few months. Um, and then I'll try and leave some time for questions at the end. OK, so as I said, I wanted to start by talking a bit about where language models even came from. Um, and to do this, we, we had to take a little trip about an hour outside of London, just to the outskirts of Milton Keynes. Um, and we will go to this, this really beautiful stately home just outside Milton Keynes. We'll also want to travel back in time to um, about 80 years into the past. OK, so does anyone know where we are? You can just shout it out if you know. Yeah, very good, yeah. So, so this is Bletchley Park. And for those of you that don't know, Bletchley Park is where Alan Turing and some of the best minds of that time gathered to try and solve a problem that was considered um, at the time to be impossible. And by solving it, they, they helped win the war and ultimately changed the course of human history. So the problem they were taking on was cracking this, the Enigma machine. So this was what was used to code messages in the war, and a sort of simplified explanation of how it works. The really important thing here is, is this part, which are our four rotors. And they, you, you adjust the rotor to the right position, and then that allows you to decode the message. So the rotor positions effectively act as our secret key. So Turing's task was to take these encrypted messages without knowing the secret key and somehow try to break them. Now, the, on the face of it, the number of rotor positions, the number of secret keys was, was massive. We're talking you know, trillions and trillions of combinations. But through various clever tricks, Turing and his team were able to reduce that space of possibilities down a lot. But it was still too much for even a huge team of humans to check. So they made use of these bomb machines, which were like early computers. And they could exhaustively search through thousands and thousands of potential rotor positions. Now, an interesting question is, these bomb machines were trying all of these different secret keys, looking for the one that was the correct key that would decrypt the message and give us back the original German communication, right? So how difficult would it have been to, to code that test, to, to look for that stopping condition where the machine could say, yep, yeah, we've hit on the right secret key. We've gone from gibberish to a real German transmission. So to illustrate this a little bit, um, I'm going to put us in the shoes of the bomb machine. right? So we're going to actually try this just to, to get a bit more insight into this whole process. 
So this is actually a real, um, a real Enigma message. This is a real message um, that was sent um, during the war. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you in a second two potential decryptions. So, so one using the actual secret key, which is going to give us back the real German message, and then one using the wrong key, which is just going to give us back some more gibberish. Um, now, the actual bomb machine would have had less than a second to make this determination. Um, I'm going to give us a little bit more time, but not much. Um, actually, before we do this, just a quick poll. Um, who in the room speaks like, absolutely no German, has never studied German in their, their lives? Uh, just see some hands. Okay, who studied a little bit, maybe in school, speaks a bit, and who you know, speaks well or is fluent, a to speaker? Okay, so it's so quite a mixture, actually. So some people are obviously going to have an advantage at this. Um, but remember, all we're trying to do is tell German um, from, from just gibberish. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show this on the next slide. As I said, I'm not going to give you long. Okay, so here are the two possibilities. Okay, how many of you are more than 90% sure you know the, the correct decryption? Okay, more than 50% sure? Okay, uh, and less than 50% sure? Okay, but pr pretty much all of you. Okay, so I'll give you a few more seconds to, to look at this and see if you can work it out. Um, the answer is the one on the right is the, um, is the real decryption. Um, and you know, the easiest way to spot this is you know, by looking out for numbers. Enigma messages tend to contain a lot of different um, numbers. Um, they'll also contain um, some military slang that we, we probably, or military abbreviations, I should say, um, that probably aren't that helpful for us, but certainly would have been for you know, Turing and his team. But there are also some interesting red herrings here. So, for example, we have this word, Zeis, which isn't a German word. Right? This, is, this is nonsense in German. And this is actually a misspelling. This is a typo. It's meant to be Zex, the, the word for six. So the point here wasn't really, you know, did you get it right or wrong? The point is actually how incredibly difficult this, this is. Right? You know, we would think it's easy just you know, trying to say, OK, is this German? But actually, when you, when you look at it, it's surprisingly difficult. And bear in mind, Turing and his team were trying to do this on the very earliest computers. And you can imagine if you tried to write a normal program, um, you know, sort of complex if statement, to, to try and um, you know, uh, implement this test and catch all of these edge cases, it just becomes incredibly difficult. So Turing had to come up with a really novel approach. Um, and um, actually, sorry, before I get into this, um, I just want to sort of underline some of these points with, with a quick comparison. So um, why, is this, why is this hard, or what are some of the features that make this hard? And I think an interesting thing to compare this to is um, decrypting Enigma messages versus decrypting a Bitcoin wallet. So um, for those of you who, who don't know, um, Bitcoins, you have to keep them in a wallet with a secret passphrase. And this is definitely a real problem. Uh, it's quite interesting. Apparently, there's $26 billion right now missing um, that's in Bitcoin wallets where people have forgotten the passwords. OK, so, so, <laughs> so this, is a, this is definitely a real problem. And by the way, cracking Bitcoin wallets isn't easy for cryptographic reasons. But a Bitcoin wallet has some really nice properties compared to, say, an Enigma message. A you know, Bitcoin wallet is fundamentally structured. It's governed by hard rules. It has a specification backing it. Um, it's fundamentally going to be clean data. You know, we have checksums, integrity protection, so we know the data is going to be clean. And so that means at the end of it, you know, we know for sure, did we guess the right password or not? You know, did we unlock the wallet or not? Whereas the, the problem Turing was wrestling with is even when they guessed the right password, the right secret key, they might not even know that they'd done it because they're dealing with these soft rules, right? You do have rules um, in these transmissions. You have, say, the rules of grammar. And also, a lot of these transmissions started off with Heil Hitler. Um, so that was a sort of a rule you could look out for, but it wasn't a guarantee. There was this noise, you know, these typos, transmission errors. And so fundamentally, even when they, they hit on that right key, they didn't know for sure they had. So this is where language models came in. Um, Turing's key insight, and this was an insight that uh, Andrei Markov, who you also might have heard of, this is where Markov models come from. Um, what these two realized was that um, it's all about likelihood. It's all about probability. You can never write an if statement that's just going to give you a true or false result at the end. You have to deal in terms of high likelihood or low likelihood. 
And this can allow you to create something that's going to be robust enough to deal with all this mess, with all of these edge cases. So, you know, where we have Zex spelled correctly, maybe that means that the language model will say, hey, there's a 78% chance this is the correct decryption. Um, and when we introduce the misspelling, that probability, that likelihood will drop, but hopefully it won't crash completely to zero and we get you know, a, um, a false negative here. So what actually was this language model? Well, we're gonna look at that, what these models uh, are and what these models were uh, a little bit later, but I do just wanna point out a couple of really important things here. So again, it's all about likelihoods and fundamentally what the language model is doing is we're feeding it a text a potential decryption, and we're asking the model, is this German? What's the likelihood that this is, this is a German message? And it's giving us a likelihood back. Now, Turing didn't do this, but a very common thing for us to do now is to use multiple language models in concert. So if we were trying to sort texts into English text and German text, we might use two language models, an English and a German, and use the highest likelihood to decide, in this case, this text is probably German. And one other thing I should point out here is since language models were pioneered by Turing, they've gone on to be used in a whole bunch of different applications. Um, but for today, we're, we're mainly gonna focus on the, the core application that, that Turing was focused on, which is using language models for classifying data and understanding data. Okay, so with that bit of background about language models, let's turn our attention now to unstructured data. So first of all, what is unstructured data? Well, it's one of these things that's sort of easier to define by what it's not. So we've all probably worked with structured data, right? Which is sort of anything you can represent in tabular form with a fixed set of columns and then you know, uh, a bunch of rows, examples, conforming to those, those columns, those features. And there's a temptation to think that all data looks like this. But there's tons of data information around us that isn't structured at all. So you know, you've got tweets, comments, um, Wikipedia articles, uh, police reports, health records, um, web pages, written notes, all of these things that it's very easy not to think of these as data, but they absolutely are, and they can be incredibly valuable. And in fact, a study by McKinsey and the IDC found, or estimated I should say, that around 90% of an organization's data is unstructured. So, if we're ignoring the, the bottom of this iceberg, if we're only looking at structured data, we're potentially missing an absolutely huge quantity of uh, information and insight. And to underscore this, I wanna now walk through some case studies of where um, unstructured data and language models are used to generate novel insight. And these are a mixture of hypothetical studies and real studies, but they're all grounded in, in real ways we can use language model with unstructured data. Okay, so for our first case study, I want us to put ourselves in the shoes of a data scientist at Marvel, um, which is now part of Disney. Okay, so we've, um, so Marvel has just released um, a trailer for um, Inhumans, a new TV show. Um, actually, just out of interest, has anyone seen this show, Inhumans, by, by a show of hands? Okay, so not very popular in this room, um, and it wasn't actually, the trailer wasn't very popular when it was released. So these are real stats, and this got a really negative reception certainly for, for Marvel, which usually, usually generates a lot of excitement. So we're called in as Marvel's data scientists to try and understand this and suggest some, some actionable next steps. Now, there is some structured data, so we could look at things like the like count versus dislike count, we could look at the number of views, but to be honest, that structured data doesn't give us that much interesting insight, right? We could, we could um, you know, put that into a chart and say, okay, about a third of people disliked it, but it's not telling us much, it's certainly not actionable. So how can we get some richer insight? So a really nice source of insight here is the comments. So um, about 13,000 comments were left on this video. So a, a really classic way to use language models to get some nice insight would be to use sentiment analysis. Uh, perform sentiment analysis on these comments. And this is a, a classic use of language models where we'll have um, a positive, uh, a language model looking for positive comments, one looking for negative comments, and then we'll use that to then classify every comment. Um, it's worth pointing out that we do need two different models here. You might think we could get away with one, but just because a comment has a low likelihood of being positive doesn't automatically mean it's negative. It could just be very neutral or it could just be gibberish. So 
you know, we can do our classification, and at first glance, it seems like we haven't really generated anything novel or new. Um, we've just said, okay, this many positive, this many negative. But from here, we can start to do some pretty interesting things. So one thing is we can pay attention to the, those likelihoods that we're getting back. And we can use those to start inferring the, um, the strength of the sentiment, right? So if we have one comment that's coming back with a 95% likelihood of being negative, we can use that to say, well, to infer that the comment is probably much more negative in its tone. And we can start to kind of create a bit of a gradient of sentiment. And this can lead to some more granular insights, right? So here, for example, we can see actually a good number of people like this trailer, but they're sort of a little bit faint in their praise, whereas the people who, who don't like it really seem to despise it. We can go even deeper, right? And we can take our group of positive comments and our negative comments, and we can start looking at what words are particularly characteristic, characteristic or discriminative between the two groups. So I actually, I actually did this for real. Um, I used Google's sentiment analysis um, model, because that's, that's really a really, really good one. Um, and then I used something called TFIDF to extract the words that were particularly characteristic. So these are the real results. So the green words are associated with positive comments. So you can see people like, like Joey, who's one of the characters. They like Ewan Rian, who's, who's an actor. He was in Game of Thrones. Um, they seem to respond positively to the villains, um, to the fight choreography. Um, and people also seem to really like the explosions. Um, looking at the negative stuff, I mean, it's not great news, to be honest. People really don't like the CGI, the effects. There's a lot of com comments about it seeming very cheap, low budget. Um, people don't like the, the story um, or the dialogue. Um, so it doesn't look great, but at least theoretically from here, you know, we could go back with some actionable insight, like saying, uh, for the next trailer, we need more explosions and less dialogue, or, or whatever we decide. <laughs> um, so the, the key takeaway here I, I want you to take from this case study is that we can often get some richer insights right, by using, leveraging the unstructured data with language models. OK, this next case study is, is quite interesting to me. Um, so this is uh, going to put us in the position of a data scientist at a, a fictional business. Let's call it Acme Inc. And let's say it makes furniture. And it's been running for a few years, but the business has been quite slack on its data collection. So uh, we um, have some existing customers, but we really don't know anything about them. Are they male, female? How old are they? Uh, anything like that. So we could start collecting this data um, and playing catch up. Um, but we we want to have a look at what data we already have access to. So we have some active social media accounts, and we have a good number of followers on Twitter. So the data scientist becomes interested in, can we look at the followers? Can we look at their tweets? And using that data, can we start to infer some of these characteristics? Are they male? Are they female? How old are they? Um, so um, uh, I should actually say at this point, um, I have no idea if doing this for real would be GDPR compliant or anything like that. Probably not, so, so don't necessarily do this yourself, but it's an interesting thought exercise. So just looking at the content of those followers' tweets, can we start inferring age, gender, and so on? And you know, we could use computer vision on the profile pictures and things like that, but, but just looking at the content, can we do this? So this is exactly what they do every year at this conference called PAN. They basically have a challenge where different teams to compete um, to use the content of tweets to identify um, the gender and age of the authors of the tweets. Uh, and I, I find the results pretty amazing. So theoretically, based on um, just the content of your tweets, the best team at PAN could correctly guess your gender 82% of the time. And they could correctly guess your gender and your, uh, the age bracket that you sit in uh, more than half of the time, 52% of the time. So hypothetically, we could apply these kind of techniques with a language model that, you know, that we've trained. And this is what they do at PAN. They, they train these language models. And they put in uh, the tweets and say, is this author male, um, and get a likelihood back. And using that, we can kind of start to build up some profile of our existing customer base, just based on the data that we already have access to. And of course, you know, it would have been better if we had you know, had some more foresight and we had you know, collected some of this customer data from day one. But you know, this doesn't always happen in the real world. And you know, the second key takeaway here is that um, 
using unstructured data with language models can be really good for post hoc analysis. You might be sitting on um, data that you didn't know was important at the time in an unstructured format, and you can go back after the fact and extract some useful insights from it. OK, so for the third case study, this is a real academic study that was done last year. And this tackled a really, really important issue, arguably the, the biggest issue facing uh, the world, which is coronary heart disease. So coronary heart disease kills about 80 million people a year. Um, it's the, that's a third of all deaths, and it's still the biggest killer worldwide. Now, um, there are various ways to tackle coronary heart disease. One of the most popular treatments is to take statins. So statins basically, um, I think, reduce cholesterol and thin the blood, and they're taken by about 200 million people worldwide. So that's one in 35 people on the planet. And it's even higher in the UK. About one in 10 people in the UK are taking statins right now to manage coronary heart disease. Now, statins are really effective. They do have some side effects, so they can cause muscle soreness and things like that. So some people just choose not to take statins. And a team at Harvard Medical School and elsewhere became interested in this, in studying what they call statin decline, when people just decide, no, I don't want to take statins, even though they've been recommended by my doctor. So what this team wanted to do is they wanted to compare statin decline rates at different hospitals. Because if there were some hospitals where that rate was really, really high, that could be a red flag. Like maybe the doctors aren't you know, explaining the benefits of statins well enough. And if they could tackle this, this could potentially save many, many lives. But what they found is this data just didn't exist. No one had ever, ever collected data on statin decline before. So they had a choice. They, they could go out and start collecting this data, but that could have taken years, could have cost millions of dollars. So what they decided to do instead is take a novel of approach of mining the data from patient records. So this data was captured in some form, just in the free form, unstructured doctor's notes that doctors were writing about the patients. But of course, every doctor has a different style, a different way of recording this. So it, it was quite challenging on the face of it. But they were able to successfully train a language model that could detect when st statins had been recommended, but were declined by the patients. And they rolled this out. They analyzed the uh, records of about 9,000 patients. And they were able to achieve uh, more than a 90% accuracy in terms of precision and recall. And this was a pilot study, as I said, done last year. And the plan now is to roll that out much more widely, gather a huge data set of statin decline data, and you know, identify problem spots, and hopefully save lives. So the key takeaway here is that it can often be really expensive to gather structured data sets. So we might have a much cheaper, easier alternative if we look at unstructured data. And again, language models can be a really good tool for, for doing this. So quickly, just to summarize, the disadvantages and advantages that we've seen so far of this pairing, unstructured data, language models. So the disadvantages, as we said, we're dealing with these kind of soft rules. Um, we're dealing with potentially a lot of noise. And so we're always going to have to deal uh, with the fact that we're going to get a fundamentally unclear result. We're going to have to deal with likelihoods. But the advantages is that we can get richer and deeper insight. Um, we can often do really effective post hoc analysis on our data and that ultimately it's going to be uh, cheaper and easier to do. OK, so we've spoken a lot about what language models can do. Let's speak a bit now about what they actually are. So um, I'm going to show some slides in the, uh, some code in the, the slides um, coming up now. Um, the two libraries that, that I'm kind of using and referencing are really the only two libraries I'd say you need to get started with, with language models. Um, so NLTK, the Natural Language Toolkit, it's a really nice um, library for working with any kind of language data. And there's a free book online as well, Natural Language Processing with, with Python, walks through all of its kind of different facets. Um, and Scikit-learn as well makes a really nice pairing. Um, a couple of other things to say. Um, we're going to go and, and actually see almost how these things work at a deep level. Um, but if you just want to use an off-the-shelf model, NLTK offers just pre-baked models that you can get up and running in a few lines of code. And we'll see that a bit later. Um, I should say as well, don't worry about like copying out code or anything like that. I'll, I'll put a link to these slides at the end. Um, and you can download them and, and browse them at your leisure. OK, so we have two main kinds of language model. So we have count-based language models. These are also sometimes called statistical language models. Now, these were most popular in the 80s and 90s, although they're still 
quite popular today, mainly because they're extremely fast, very fast to train um, and uh, you know, very easy to work with. And they still can produce really decent performance, um, especially when you, you know, pick the right ways of, of tuning them and tweaking them. However, these have been supplanted in terms of the state of the art by continuous space language models. Um, these are also sometimes called neural language models or neuroprobabilistic language models. So these emerged in the 2000s, 2010s. Now, they are a lot slower and more expensive to train. They're often used with neural networks, but they don't have to be. So this is where neural language model comes from. And this is where we really get our state of the art performance from. So I'm going to walk through both of these kinds of models. Let's start with our count-based models. And these fall, again, into two main groups. We have bag of words models, which are our sort of simplest models, and then the slightly more sophisticated n-gram models. So bag of words model is like the simplest model you can imagine. And we call it bag of words because basically we just, we just take our texts and treat them as just a jumble of words. So we don't care about structure. We don't care about context or word order or anything like that. We just care about what words appear and usually how many times does each word appear. So it's easiest to illustrate um, a bag of words model with an example. So let's walk through how we'd use bag of words for spam detection. So here we're using the SMS spam um, collection, which contains um, about 6,000 messages classified into spam and non-spam messages. Um, and you know, just a couple of preliminaries. We, we just In all of these cases, we're going to need a test set and a training set, uh, and a, just a standard 80-20 split will, will do us fine. All right, so these are the, the six stages that we'll need to go through. So we have sort of four pre-processing stages, um, and then the last two stages is where you know, most of the, the, the real work happens. So I'll whiz through the pre-processing stages. Um, first, we're just going to want to do some cleaning. We'll generally want to ignore um, numbers and special characters. Um, and this is obviously just a couple of lines of Python code. So something as simple as, as this will, will do the job here. Then next we want to tokenize. So this is breaking the text down into its individual words. Um, and again, we don't really care about the order of the words at all. Um, there are a couple of ways to do this. We could do something as simple as, as our top line here, just splitting on white space. Um, if we want, we can use something like NLTK, which has more robust uh, methods for tokenization, which are going to catch you know, uh, various edge cases more robustly. Another thing we'll commonly want to do is remove stop words. So th those are all the words like and, of, the, et cetera, which don't really provide us any valuable information or insight. So we'll, we'll generally strip those out. And again, a library like NLTK will, will give us a, a list of stop words that we can just load in and use to, to filter out um, our, our words that aren't going to give us any value. OK, a slightly more sophisticated step we might want to do is stem. So if we decide that a word like win is spammy, which seems likely, right? win, win this, win that, then it stands to reason that other related words like winner, winning, won, are also going to be spammy sort of by association. So to give our model more power to generalize like this, we might want to do stemming, which would take all of these words and just reduce them down to their root form, win. Now, stemming is actually surprisingly complicated to do. But again, with something like NLTK, we can just do it in a couple of lines of code. There are various stemmers uh, that are called built into NLTK. And you know, basically, that's just going to you know, chop the ending off a bunch of our words, reducing them to the root form. It's going to make our, our models um, more able to generalize. OK, so we've done all our cleaning steps. The next thing that we need to do is build a frequency matrix. So here we have all the words in our vocabulary, and the rows are each of our text messages. And we just want to keep track in each text message which words appear and how many times they appear. So again, nice and quick and simple to do this. Um, Scikit-learn has a count vectorizer built into it. So you know, we just need to load that up, fit our data um, to, the, uh, to the vectorizer, um, and then we uh, can call get feature names, which will give us back our, our vocab. And um, we can then transform our messages into an array. So this will give us back a nested array and matrix uh, like this effectively. And then the last uh, step is to um, just feed this into a classifier. 
Okay, and we can just use a classic naive Bayes classifier. Um, not one of the ones built into scikit-learn is fine. Um, a mo multinomial uh, naive Bayes classifier will work the best, but any, any um, probabilistic classifier, naive Bayes classifier, is gonna, is gonna work completely fine. And again, we can do this in just a couple of lines of code. So we'll feed it our training data, our frequency matrix, uh, and then from there we can, we can make predictions. We can predict our new messages, is this spam or not? So a bag of words model, so ignoring things like word order and context, we're going to do really well on a data set like this. So we'll get more than a 90% accuracy. I think the highest I've seen for a bag of words model on this data set is about 93% precision and recall. But there are going to be serious limitations to this. Okay, so consider these two messages that don't appear in the data set, but imagine, imagine we're trying to classify this. Now, the first one, to me, doesn't seem particularly spammy. This seems quite benign. The second one definitely seems very, very spammy. But the problem is a bag of words model would really struggle to distinguish between these two because they basically contain exactly the same words. And, and so a bag of words model is going to fall down on this. And if we think about this a little bit, I mean, imagine trying to use a bag of words model for, say, the statin study, where we're just trying to use the words that appear anywhere in a patient's notes to try and determine uh, did they decline statins, it's just going to be impossible, right? So for any more sophisticated task, this just really isn't going to work at all. So we need something, something more sophisticated, and this is where n-gram models come in. So n-gram models are really built to tackle the problems that bag of words struggle with. So we said with, with bag of words, the problem is it just has to decide universally a word like holiday. Is this a spammy word or is it not a spammy word? Is it evidence you know, for spam or against spam? What an n-gram model allows us to do is it allows us to ask, is the word holiday spammy or not, given the context that's around it? So as humans, we'll generally consider all the context around a word yeah, when thinking about it. Um, we're very, very good at doing this, but we don't want to do this when we're programming our language models for a couple of reasons. One, it's quite expensive to compute if we're trying to consider all the context, although that's become less of a concern, to be honest, as computers have gotten faster. Uh, a more pressing problem is this is going to become really prone to overfitting, and it's going to stymie our generalization. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to consider just limited context. We're just going to consider a limited number of uh, N words um, before uh, every word that we're analyzing. And this is where the, word, uh, this is where the name n-gram comes from. So a bag of words model, we could also think of it as a unigram model because it's only ever considering one word. But we can make bigram models where we're going to consider the word immediately preceding it, trigram models, which we'll consider the previous two, and then we have four gram, five gram, and, and so on. Okay, so to understand how these work, let's walk through a little mini example. So we have a toy training corpus here. I am Sam, Sam I am. I do not like green eggs and ham. Uh, and a test sentence here yeah, uh, in our test set, I am Sam, I do. So we're going to want to start with some pre-processing steps. We can reuse the same pre-processing steps with one big difference. We don't want to remove stop words here because we want to preserve the context and preserve the structure in this case. But we can do everything else just the same. So this is what happens when I do this. Not a big change because this is already quite simple. Okay, so from here what we're going to do is we're going to take each pair of words and then we're going to basically compute the probability of that pair. And we're going to do this by looking at how many times the first, uh, the first word appears um, and the number of times that the second word follows the first word. Okay. So, for example, we can see here that the word I appears three times, and the word I is followed by am in two out of three, those three cases. So we can kind of say the probability of this pair is like two-thirds, right? So intuitively, hopefully, that kind of makes sense. And then we do the same for the next pair of words. Right, so we can see am appears twice, and in one of those cases, it's followed by sam. So we can say the probability of this pair is about one half. So we'll do that for all of our pairs, and then we'll have a bunch of probabilities. Now from here, we can just, if we want, multiply these together, and then we get a kind of likelihood um, from that. And this is perfectly fine. But there are a couple of limitations with this approach. So the first kind of problem is, if we start making a much longer sentence and we get more probabilities, 
this is going to start um, tending towards, uh, towards zero, right? Because we've got these probabilities that are all less than one. So as we start multiplying lots of these together, the numbers are going to get smaller and smaller. And so it kind of discriminates against long sentences, and it means it's quite hard to compare a long sentence and a short one and say which one is more likely. Another just more mundane reason is small numbers are kind of a pain to work with. Right? If we're trying to wrap our heads around 0 0.009 versus 0 0.0009, it's not that intuitive. So for that reason, we tend to prefer a different measure. And it's really easy to compute. We multiply our probabilities in exactly the same way, but then we take the nth root. So if we had three probabilities, we'd take the cube root, uh, or the fourth root, fifth root, and so on. Um, and that kind of normalizes long and short sentences and makes us able to compare them. And then we just take the reciprocal. We take one over that number we've computed, and that avoids small numbers. And we call this measure perplexity. And for perplexity, lower is better. So we want to reduce perplexity. Um, and in this case, if we, we plug that formula in here, for this example, we'd get a perplexity of just over two. This is unrealistically no, we'll never see a perplexity this low, really. Um, in real life, we'd expect a perplexity of something like 30 to 150 on most data sets. OK, so um, just to, to recap here, we can think of perplexity as kind of like a measure of surprise. So we want to minimize that on our training and test set. We don't want it to be surprised by the language we're feeding it. That shows that we've modeled the language well. And then once we've finished training, we can use that perplexity for classification. So we could say, hey, if a message gives us a perplexity of less than 100, then it's probably spam. Otherwise, it's probably not. OK, so there's one quick detail that I did skip. Um, so the, those of you that are really eagle-eyed might have noticed, we didn't actually consider the probability of this first word, I. Yeah, we com considered the probability of am given I, but we didn't consider the probability of our start word. So what we do um, in real life is we're going to add start and end tokens. So we're going to basically look and see, OK, well, out of the three sentences I started, I started two of them with I. So I can kind of say there's a, a two-third probability that I is my start word. Okay. Um, and the nice thing about using these special tokens is we don't need any kind of special logic here. We just treat them just like any other word. OK, so this is theoretically all we need to build an n-gram model. And this will work up to a point. But there is a really big problem. So this we can see with a slightly different test sentence. So if we tried I like green egg and ham, uh, remember it's egg, by the way, because we did stemming. Um, then we run into a big problem. Because for our first probability, we're going to say, OK, how many times did I appear, and how many times did like follow I? But we can see that like never followed I. We never had I like in our training corpus. So our first probability is going to be 0. And of course, then, if we're multiplying by 0, it doesn't matter what our other probabilities are. We're, um, we're going to end up with 0. And then depending on how you treat division by 0, we're either going to get an error or we're going to get an infinite perplexity, which basically says it's impossible that this, this is the kind of language we're looking for. So you might be wondering, does this happen on larger data sets? Let's look at a real, more real-world example. So here, I've trained a language model on the complete works of Shakespeare. And this is actually a real, um, a real thing that people often do because there's quite a lot of debate around like Shakespeare authorship. Um, and you know, there are various texts where people aren't sure whether Shakespeare wrote it. So people actually do use Shakespeare language models quite a lot. Um, and then my test set, I'm going to use Romeo and Juliet, which I excluded from the training set. So I haven't done stemming here, um, just to keep things simple. OK, so, we, so these are real numbers. So um, in Shakespeare's works, the word but appears about 6,000 times and is followed by the word thou about 60 times. Um, thou appears again about 6,000 times and is followed by art about 400 times. Now, we continue walking through until we get to this, uh, this pair quickly moved. Now, interestingly, quickly moved never appears in any of Shakespeare's other works. So again, we're going to get a probability of 0 for this um, word pair. And the kind of annoying thing here is, so as we know, we're going to get an infinite perplexity. But what's kind of annoying is, if we just ignored that, we'd end up with a perplexity of 60, which, remember, is really good. You know, this is strong evidence that this is indeed Shakespeare writing this. But somehow, um, we've crashed instead to infinity. 
So to solve this, we, we need to bring in smoothing. And this is all about solving that problem, um, all about preventing our probabilities crashing to zero. Now, there are a ton of different smoothing approaches. So um, all of these are valid. Um, we have good Turing smoothing. So our friend Turing, again, this is the smoothing technique that he developed at Bletchley Park for the, the language modeling they were doing there. We're going to look at absolute discounting for a couple of reasons. One, it's nice and simple, but also because um, it lays the foundation for Knaes and Nye smoothing, which is the current state of the art. OK, so remember we said the problem is that quickly move never appears in the rest of Shakespeare's canon. But the word quickly does appear. And these are, all of, these are some of the words that, that follow it. So quickly often ends a sentence. Um, uh, quickly, we have things like quickly and, quickly make, quickly send. These are all, all words that follow quickly. Um, and there are about 80 words that follow quickly altogether. But there are 28,000 words that never follow quickly, including the word moved. So we have this like, deeply unfair situation where less than 1% of the words control 100% like, of the probability, um, which is definitely like, a protest-worthy situation. Um, and, and weirdly, we kind of do the same thing in, in this case that we, that we propose in society when we see this kind of problem, which is effectively taxation. So what we're going to do is we're going to tax every word on the left here, every word that has a non-zero count, um, by some delta. So 0 0.5 is, is pretty normal. So we're going to reduce all of these counts by 0 0.5. And remember, we have 80 words, and we've reduced all of those 80 by 0 0.5. So we've kind of collected 40 points, if you like, of tax. And what we're going to then do is we're going to share that out equally among all the other 28,000 words. So these words are going to each get a really small trace amount of probability, if you like. So what that's going to mean, then, if we plug these adjusted numbers into our formula, is now for quickly moved, we have a really small trace count. Now, that is going to increase the perplexity significantly, but it's not going to be an infinite perplexity anymore. So we've got, we've got 175, which is just beyond the bounds of, of the kind of perplexity we would want to see, but it's a lot better than infinity. OK, so. We've only spoken so far about bigram models, but we can open this up to trigram models, foregram models, and so on, considering more context. Now, the pros here are that um, these models will be smarter, if you like. They're going to consider more context. But there are a couple of cons. So one is that they're going to be more expensive to train, slower to train. To be honest, this isn't a big problem now with modern computers. But a bigger problem is data sparsity. And what I mean by this is, Let's revisit that quickly moved example. Now we have, if we're doing a trigram model where we're considering the probability of two given the prefix quickly moved, we have an even more acute problem, right? Because in this case, we're trying to say, well, how many times did two appear after quickly moved? Well, the answer to that question is zero. But on top of that, the answer to the question, how many times did the prefix quickly moved appear, is also zero, right? So, Something like absolute discounting can't help us in this case because we have nothing to tax. Right? Everything is zero across the board. So smoothing alone can't help us. We have this situation where we have a trigram model, which is in theory smarter and better because it considers more context. But in some cases, a trigram model will just fail completely. Our bigram model now with smoothing is less smart, but it is robust. It will always give us back a reasonable answer. So basically, the solution here is we have to combine our higher order models, like our trigram models, with our lower order models, our bigram. And there are two ways to do this. So one is we can do interpolation, which is basically we, we ask both of these models for, our, for their predictions, and then we combine them. So we would say take 2 thirds of the trigram model's prediction and 1 third of the bigram model's prediction, and we just add them up. Okay, so that's one approach. The second approach, which is even simpler, is back off. So basically, we rely on the trigram by default until we hit a snag and it can't give us um, a reasonable prediction. And then we basically fall back to our bigram model. OK, so um, this is all you need to know about n-gram models. Um, and as I said, the current state of the art for this is to use um, Kinesa and I smoothing with interpolation. That, that's currently going to give us the best results. And on many tasks, this is going to perform really admirably. 
Um, and the nice thing, as I said, is you know, hopefully now you understand how these models work internally, but if you want, you can just use an off-the-shelf version with something like NLTK. You can load up a model um, you know, with the right smoothing, and it will do everything, you know, compute the perplexity for you, and so on. Okay, so those are our count-based models. They're, they're fast and they're performant when we pick the right smoothing, interpolation settings, and so on. But they do suffer from some limitations. So um, Jeffrey Hinton has this kind of uh, nicely colorful example for us, where if we have a sentence in our training corpus, like the cat got squashed in the garden on Friday, and then in our test corpus we have the dog got flattened in the garden on Tuesday, well, it's likely that the perplexity here is going to be uh, pretty high. Because actually, if you look at the pairs or triplets of words, um, there's not that much commonality between them. But as humans, we can obviously observe a lot of similarity, right? You know, there's obviously some connection between dogs and cats, Fridays and Tuesday, and squashed and flattened are basically the same thing. Now, people have been aware of this for a long time, and in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of experimenting with using thesaurus-based methods, for example. But those weren't that successful, because although we could say, okay, squashed and flattened are sort of the same thing, cat and dogs and Fridays and Tuesdays are fundamentally different, but they, they share some essence, right? And no one really had a particularly good way of capturing that um, until the early 2000s, when we got continuous space models. So the key idea with continuous space models is we use word embeddings. We use word vectors. And the key thing for word embeddings, word vectors, is that similar words should uh, live close to each other. Words that sh share the same essence should be close. And words that are very different should be far apart. Now, um, a, an easy way to um, understand this is not to use words, but to use emoji. Because usually with words, they're quite complicated. We're using a lot of dimensions. But with emoji, we can keep things simple, and we can actually visualize things in 2D. So this is um, some emoji embeddings, or emoji vector. Um, and these are just emoji arranged. And you can do this you know, you can do this manually, but you can do this through automated means. So that similar emoji are close together. So you can see, you know, we've got like our clocks together, some special characters. Uh, what else have we got? You know, we've got um, you know, uh, animals. Um, you know, we've got some food and drink over here. So landscape. So this is, um, these are emoji vectors. And these are the kind of thing that we're going to leverage in a continuous space model. OK, so we'll consider bigrams again, so pairs of emoji. Um, and we'll consider things that could come after heart. So let's say in our training corpus, we have a lot of instances of heart beer. Yeah? So whoever we've collected this from really loves beer. And so um, after, so let's say um, about half of all uses of emoji after heart is the beer emoji. So we would say there's like a 50% likelihood, something like that, of heart beer. OK, uh, let's say that neither of these pairs appear. So love coffee doesn't appear. Um, and Love aerial tramway doesn't appear either. Uh, a fun fact is this was the world's least popular emoji, um, although recently I think it's gone up a couple of ranks because there was a bit of a sympathy campaign to, to boost it up a bit. Um, OK, so, so neither of these pairs appear. Now, um, now, the kind of naive approach without smoothing is to just say, well, OK, neither of them appear, so they're both impossible, probability of 0. Now, equipped with smoothing, we could do a little better and maybe assign them both some trace probability. But using this representation, using these vectors, we can do much better than that still. So we can look and we can see, well, look, beer and coffee are really close together. They're obviously very similar, whereas beer and aerial tramway are very far apart. They're clearly very different. And then we can use this to scale the probabilities we're assigning and say, well, clearly coffee should be much more likely, logically, than aerial tramway. So how do we do this? Well, you know, again, we could figure this out mathematically, but a much better way in practice is to use neural networks. So um, we'll just have a simple neural network where our inputs will be the coordinates of our, um, of our current emoji and our previous emoji on that 2D plane. Um, and then we'll have our hidden layer leading to some output. And we'll train that on our training data. And because of how neural networks um, behave, effectively, as we change the input slightly you know, and we substitute beer for a very similar emoji, a close-by emoji, um, it's going to lead to a similar output. Whereas if we drastically change this um, to, say, aerial tramway, it's going to give us uh, a different result. It's going to give us a lower likelihood. 
Um, let's just take a, a second example how this would look with three emoji. So here we imagine this is in our test set, uh, sorry, our training set, um, but this one isn't. Um, again, we might have something like this during training. So you know, we in this case have six inputs because we're um, looking at th uh, three emoji, each with two dimensions. And then just because these, uh, this new emoji is very close to our previous one, we'll change the input slightly and get a similar output likelihood. Um, if you are interested in wrapping your brain around this more, I'd really recommend this course from Jeffrey Hinton. Um, it's, it's just a great course all around, um, but there's a, about a quarter of the course is dedicated just to this, to using neural networks for continuous space language models. Um, okay, so what about real world word vectors? How do they look? And how do we even construct them? So you can build word vectors yourself. As we'll see in a second, it's probably not the best plan in most cases. But how this would work is basically we'll have thousands or potentially up to millions of different words in our vocabulary. And then we'll have millions and billions or, or millions or billions of documents. And we'll basically track how many times each word appears. It's exactly the same as our frequency matrix for bag of words, right? Um, but just a lot bigger. And this matrix is going to be very, very sparse. Then we'll apply dimensionality reduction, um, and there's all kinds of techniques, and it's sort of beyond the scope of the talk to say you know, exactly how this would look, but basically we're kind of trying to crunch this matrix down to something much smaller while preserving as much of the information as possible. And so what we'll end up with is something with much fewer columns, same number of words, but much fewer columns, uh, typically about 300 dimensions. Um, and we can do this ourselves, but typically we'll use an off-the-shelf um, pre-trained set of word vectors. And there are really three main players from Facebook, Google, and Stanford. Um, and there are slight differences between them. Um, but as you can see here, these, these to be honest, are much of a muchness. Um, they're all trained on really, really big general purpose data sets. They all have, um, well, 300 or up to 300 dimensions. Um, and these are, these are going to perform really, really well for most tasks. Um, and if we're using something like uh, you know, fast text pre-trained vectors, everything is exactly the same, except we'll have 900 uh, inputs into our neural network, um, one for each of the 300 dimension vectors that we're putting in. So really from 2000 up to, you know, up to now, there's been a lot of work um, just playing around with, with various configurations of neural networks. So you know, all the kind of things that we see in a lot of different um, areas using um, uh, um, RNNs, CNNs, using ensemble learning, using long and short term memory networks. So um, you know, all the kind of classic tweaks um, that, uh, that we would expect to see. Um, and that's you know, kind of inched performance up year on year. Now. Um, one thing to point out is some of these cutting edge techniques can become extremely, extremely expensive. So um, there's a paper two years ago from Google called Exploring the Limits of Language Modeling. Uh, and they t trained a bunch of, of models, different models, mainly neural models, but they did train one um, count-based statistical model. So they did a five gram model with kinase and I smoothing. Um, and that achieved a perplexity score of 67 on a big data set called the Billion Words data set. Um, and that took about two hours to train, and that was just using a CPU, so no, no GPU. So um, that, was, that was pretty fast. The best performing model was what they called their big LSTM, um, and that performed twice as well, more than twice as well in terms of perplexity. Um, so that's really good, but it was incredibly expensive to train. So Google trained it. Um, so first of all, they used um, 32 NVIDIA Tesla GPUs, uh, which at the time cost about 2K each. So it was about 64K worth of GPUs. And they trained this model uh, nonstop for three weeks. Um, so it gives you some sense of how incredibly expensive these cutting edge models can be. Now, because of this, um, there, was, uh, there was always this sense of, can we do better? Um, and until this year, the answer was, was really no. Um, and gains continue to be very costly. Um, but then something happened just this year. Okay? And um, there was an article published in The Gradient, maybe some of you saw, saying NLP's ImageNet moment has arrived. And what the author meant by this uh, is that something happened 
um, something is happening that's very similar to what happened with computer vision and image classification. So ImageNet, if you don't know, is a huge database of 14 million images broken down into 20,000 categories. So this was very, very challenging, required very, very big, sophisticated models. But as people were tackling ImageNet, they found there was a really nice, interesting side effect that was happening, which was that when they took these models that were trained on ImageNet, um, they were able to reuse the weights that they'd learnt on completely different, unrelated tasks, and they found that that made a massive boost in significant, uh, sorry, a massive boost in performance. And this is, this is transfer learning. So you train something on a big general purpose data set, and then you're able to transfer it then to many, many different tasks. So there was sort of this holy grail for a long time in the world of language models of this universal language model, this super powerful general purpose language model that we could train once and then reuse for lots of different tasks. But although it was good in theory, it was never really realized um, for a long time until this year. And as is often the way with these things, you wait ages for a universal language model and then three turn up at once. And there have been three um, really, really um, impressive universal language models that have come out in the past few months. So you have ULM Fit from Fast AI, um, Elmo from uh, Allen AI, and uh, OpenAI's Transformer. And um, these, are, um, these are all um, slightly different, but um, these are fundamentally huge models trained on um, billions of words uh, at, for a long time. So I don't know the training times for all of them, but I know OpenAI was trained on eight GPUs for a month. So um, big models. But what's nice is they're general purpose. You can download them, and then you can just tweak them for your specific task and get really, really good performance. Um, so this is from the Elmo paper. This is, by the way, maybe my favorite chart from an academic paper ever. Um, so on the, on the left, you can see this, this yellow. It was the previous state of the art. Um, the green is the baseline. And where, where you have Elmo, there is the boost um, that was, was given by using um, the Elmo model. And you can see, in pretty much all cases, it either, it either matched or exceeded the previous state of the art. So um, this, this was a pretty huge deal. Uh, as I said, it's only emerged in the past few months, so this is still very cutting edge. Um, if you want to get started with this kind of stuff, there are a couple of places I'd suggest you start. So one is FastAI has a tutorial which walks you through using their, their model um, uh, on the IMDB data set, which is a sentiment analysis data set. And um, this achieved a new state of the art. So this, this outperformed all previous uh, attempts on this, on this data set. And they'll walk you through exactly how to achieve that. That, that figure. Um, if any of you use TensorFlow, um, Elmo is now available on TensorFlow Hub. And so what that means is you can actually load up the pre-trained Elmo model in literally just like one line of, of code, which is pretty cool. OK, so, um, so lastly, just to, to wrap up the key points. So, um, so unstructured data is a really powerful and plentiful source of insight. Um, it's more than 90% of all the data we have access to, and really powerful when combined with language models. Um, it does have its uh, rough parts. We have to deal with these soft rules, noise, um, and you know, we're going to have to deal with likelihoods rather than um, kind of binary outcomes. But it can give us much richer insights, um, allow for post hoc analysis, and can often be a lot cheaper compared to collecting st structured data. We have count-based models, and they're fast, and they still work really well in many cases. Uh, if we want to use n-gram models, then interpolated Kinesa and I will generally give us the best uh, results. Um, if we want to go and push ourselves even further, we can use um, neural networks with pre-trained word vectors from the likes of Google and Facebook. And if we want to really be on the cutting edge, um, then I'd encourage you to experiment with these universal language models um, tuned to your particular task. OK, so uh, that's everything from me. Uh, thank you all so much for listening. Um, I've put the slides online um, at this address, so, so feel free to, to grab them. They're online now. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take any, any questions now. Probable in the in the real 
get the green horn, it would give it a, a higher score because green is so close to white and brown, it is also a color. Yeah. So is this still a problem? Yeah, it's a really good question. So, so uh, for, for anyone who didn't hear the question, the problem is with continuous space models, do you get a problem of overgeneralization? So you say, you say uh, have white horse in the training corpus, and then you see brown horse, and you say, yeah, that looks fine. Um, but then you see green horse, and then you say, yeah, that looks fine to me as well. Um, and it's a really good question. And yeah, it absolutely does, does happen. Um, so uh, it depends on uh, a lot of different things. Um, so one thing that, that helps is um, where you have these, these word vectors that are trained on huge data sets with quite a lot of dimensions, 300 dimensions, um, that tends to, to help a lot because the, the data is so huge um, that the vectors do a good job of capturing the different relationships between, um, between the words, right? So you know, rather than having, say, one dimension, to represent you know, what color means, um, you might have multiple dimensions kind of capturing that essence. And so somehow white and brown is distinguishable from green because, because of the different contexts it's used in. I mean, uh, another way to get around this is, um, and one thing we didn't touch on, is you can start to get quite uh, complex in the way that you consider context. So for um, we haven't talked about it, but there's this idea of using um, skip gram models, which is going to look at not just the previous words, but it's going to start skipping words and looking all around the sentence to try and build a, a much better picture of, hey, does this sentence truly represent the kind of language that I'm trying to model? The other thing as well is just tons of training data. So this is, this is one of these cases where, um, and as you can kind of probably tell with Google's example, generally speaking, doing more training, leading this training for longer, um, it's not going to saturate generally. More data and more training is, is always going to make these models smarter and help with that brown horse, white horse, green horse kind of case. Um, Yeah, so so I suppose that the, the white horse, um, the white horse, brown horse, green horse example, that would you would imagine that that would be um, uh, captured quite well by by a general purpose model, right? Because it's just a fundamental truth about um, about the world or the universe. Um, where you could start running into problems is using you know like a, you, you know pre-trained vectors or um, or a universal language model. If there's something, if there's um, an idea that makes sense in the general world, but shouldn't really make sense in your particular, you know, set or, or data set or whatever, then yeah, as you say, you've got something that's more got a better general understanding of the world, but then you have to sort of undo that and train it down more to your specific case. And I, I don't think there's like a magic bullet for that. I mean, training your own word vectors, if you have enough data, can in some cases address that case, right, where you don't want the the how you know, general the uh, word vectors coming from somewhere like Facebook or Google is. Um, yeah, it, there's really no silver bullet, but it's a, a really good point and a, and a really good question. Um, any other questions from anyone? Uh, yes, I'll start with you, and then I'll go to you in the way. Uh, how can you handle data sets with uh, many different languages? Yeah, so it's a good question. So, so how would you deal with um, many different languages, maybe different languages um, uh, overlapping in the same document. Um, so there's not necessarily, again, uh, one approach. Uh, probably you'd, you'd put it through a pipeline. So you know, the good news is language t detection is, is quite robust now. You, you're going to see a very high accuracy for language detection with most languages. So you would probably try and separate out the different languages that appear in your text. And then the good news is that things like uh, you know, fast text and Google, they um, the stats that I showed on the slide were for the English vectors, but they do also have um, word vectors, pre-trained word vectors for pretty much all of your common languages. Um, now, with the universal language models, those only exist for English right now, as far as I'm aware. So we, you won't be able to take advantage of those for a little while um, in other languages. Um, but things like word vectors and so on uh, certainly exist for, for other languages. Um, yeah, the, the chap in the white.
Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. So the question was was about um, misspellings and uh, uh, and how to deal with with those, especially if you want to preserve misspellings. So there's um, there's a um, there are a few different ways to deal with with misspellings. So um, we could just try and actually correct misspellings and just treat them as noise and say we want to capture um, you know, w w the word that someone actually meant. We might, though, for example, a good example might be for, say, the, uh, the Twitter uh, age detection and uh, gender detection, but I'm specifically thinking about age. Um, I mean, I'm stereotyping here, but like, let's say if it's a the, the author is a 13-year-old, um, maybe we would expect more misspellings compared to you know, someone in their 40s. So actually, if we throw away those misspellings, we might be losing some valuable information. Um, I think most of the pre-trained word vectors will preserve some of the most um, uh, common misspellings, um, but they won't you know, they won't uh, handle all of those different, uh, those different cases. Um, what you might try and do, again, is, is combine multiple uh, models in an ensemble. So maybe you, just, you have one model that's just looking at the actual content of the words, um, and then you have a second model that's looking out for misspellings and then using that to affect your you know, classification probability or, or whatever else you need. So, so that would probably be my go-to, have a general purpose model and then have a separate model looking out for, for misspellings and what those might signify separately. Um, uh, but, but yeah, uh, your, your kind of uh, mileage might vary. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. So, um, so the so the, the question was: Am I aware of any attempts to um, leverage more about the actual structure of um, of language? So, you know, the grammar, the structure of the sentence, rather than just the words used in their order. Um, so, the, so it's definitely an active area of research. Um, I guess that the the problem is that um, sort of passing and understanding the structure and grammar of sentences is actually still surprisingly difficult in some ways. So the risk is that um, you're trying to uh, understand the structure of the sentence in order to make a prediction, where you actually end up just having you know, two problems rather than one problem, because first you have to kind of unpick the structure and everything like that. And as far as I know, I think empirically, I'm trying to bring in more information about you know, parts of speech and, and so on on most tasks uh, doesn't tend to help particularly. Um, there are definitely um, tasks where, um, where it, can, it can, be, um, can be helpful, um, but, um, and often it will be things like you know, trying to distinguish um, verbs from adjectives or noun forms or whatever, where the same word might have quite different meaning if it's a noun versus if it's a verb. So it definitely does happen, and on certain tasks, I think it would, would definitely um, make an impact, but it's, it's probably not the most popular approach right now. Uh, yes. Uh, I think um, I would add to that question that there is a uh, report of Google syntactic engrams uh, that can be used. Uh, and syntactic engrams or engrams for, uh, from dependencies, dependencies can, can be used to measure grammaticality, for example, of sentences. And that helps uh, for this particular task. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should, um, uh, I should probably, it's, it's a good point. And for those that didn't hear, is that um, you have Google's syntactic engrams, and it can help for, say, measuring things like grammatical grammaticality. Um, I, I should sort of, um, yeah, slightly um, nuance my answer by saying that um, in terms of things like classification, um, it's probably things like grammar and so on play less of a role. But for some of the other tasks that I showed on the slide that language models are used for, um, grammar and structure will be incredibly important. So machine translation, for example, um, that would be hugely important. And in a case like that, um, you, you would definitely want to pass the structure of the sentence and so on um, as part of doing that um, translation step. Uh, for classification, it definitely happens. And for some tasks, it will be, be useful. But but often we're, we're safe to just ignore the, the grammar and focus on the, the words and the vocab used. Okay, any other, any other questions? Um, all right, well, feel free to, to come up and ask a question directly afterwards if you'd like. Um, but otherwise, just thanks again for, for listening. And uh, yeah, I hope you all enjoyed.